Ever since the first Ford Model T started rolling off the production line more than 100 years ago, the dream of car ownership, or rather the status that car ownership conveyed, has been a very persistent one in society. In the very early days of automobiles, owning a car meant you were someone important. You were successful. Later on, car ownership has come to mean a whole lot of other things too. And the car you purchased says a lot about you. I mean, you only have to look back in the British history books to see how a Morris Minor two-door was seen as inferior to a four-door, despite being structurally a lot stronger, something that I and Kate Walton Elliott still banter about till this day, because I used to own a two-door and she had to be posh with a four-door. If you were in the market back in the UK in the 70s for an Austin and you wanted to be seen to be a little more extra than your middle terrace neighbours, you went for a Van den Pla, faux wood for the win. And of course, in the modern age of the EV, the type of EV you choose to buy says a lot about you, from how much money you make to what you might enjoy doing at the weekend, and yes, what your own personal values and belief systems might be. Like home ownership, car ownership is still held by many as a life goal, with bonus points for buying a brand new one. But just as home ownership has become generally unachievable for anyone born after oh, 1985, car ownership is also quickly becoming something that will fade into the background. And EVs are accelerating that. See, while automakers want you to drive their newest hotness, they want you to lease, not buy their new EVs. And today I'm going to explore why that is. Okay, so I'm going to admit this video's title is just a little clickbaity, but let's be honest. Had I told you that automakers don't want you to buy their electric cars because they want you to lease them instead, it'd both be a longer title and a less intriguing one. And in the world of consta scroll, we figured it would grab more attention. Before I delve into the reasons automakers want you to lease rather than buy, let's acknowledge that yes, some automakers absolutely do not want you to drive their electric cars. There is in fact some reticence among large legacy automakers to building EVs and some companies <coughs> are very much not happy about making electric vehicles. And depending on whom you talk to, who exactly is anti-EV goes from a handful of rogue automakers, old school executives, at said automakers and stuffy board members, who I might add often don't represent the desires of the company as a whole, but have a disproportionate amount of control at the same, through to everyone who isn't Tesla. The reality? The reality is a little different. I've spoken to engineers at pretty much every major automaker that makes any form of EV today, and every single one of them has been enthusiastic and excited about an all-electric future. And no, I'm not just talking about the engineers I meet at official press events who've likely been given some press training and are being trotted out because they are pro-EV. I'm talking about the engineers who regularly watch this channel and send us emails from their personal accounts. Hi! I won't say who you are, but I know there are many of you. Thanks for watching. But look, that is not what I'm going to focus on in this video. I am focusing on why automakers want you to lease rather than buy your next car. A trend that's not exclusively focused on electric vehicles, but is very much more common in the EV world when you compare it to the internal combustion engine vehicle world. Today, I want to try and explain why that's the case. And it's down to multiple different factors, including how incentives are applied, the cost to produce the vehicle and the future potential value of the parts within the vehicle. Let's start with the first sad but true point. Electric vehicles are still, on average, more expensive to both make and buy than internal combustion engine ones. While price parity is coming slowly, it's still worth noting that automakers are still making far less money on selling EVs than they are on internal combustion engine vehicles. And while, again, that depends on automakers and the platform, some automakers are doing better than others. But it's still very much less money overall 
than your run-of-the-mill ICE vehicle sale would make. And that fact means that automakers are already going to try and make every single dime they can out of you, as will dealerships. And if they can simply sell you a car, there's nothing stopping you from going to the dealership, buying the car and then never going back. And sure, while many people, including myself, tend to use the dealership they purchased a vehicle from as the place they go back to for service and recall work, there is no requirement that you, as a purchase customer, do that. OK, technically there is a requirement for recall work that you get it carried out by an approved dealership, which usually happens to be the local dealership, which is usually the dealership you purchased your car from. But I think you get my point. If you lease, meanwhile, especially if it's one of those more fancy modern types of lease subscription deals where there's an allowance built in for service costs, you are much more likely to go back to the dealership you originated the lease from. And that means more service money for the dealership, not to mention the fact that most lease deals have clauses in them that require you to get your vehicle regularly serviced. There's no requirement like that if you buy privately. Next, let's look at EV incentives and their impacts. While in many countries applying for an EV incentive is a point of sale thing and your dealership gets the money directly from whomever is providing the incentive, sometimes, as it used to be until fairly recently in the US, you, as the person buying the car, have to wait until the end of the calendar year to claim the incentive for doing so. And if you are buying outright, it's not the finance company or the dealership that gets the incentive, it's you. In the US, leasing is a little different. Leasing means that you can get the incentive applied directly to your lease, which lowers your overall monthly payment and makes it a far more affordable and approachable way to get into EV ownership if you can't afford to buy outright. You don't get to claim the incentive because you're not buying the car. Instead, either the leasing company or the dealership does. At the same time, however, you do get to pay less from day one. And also, thanks to loopholes in some markets, such as the one we have in the US right now, cars that aren't eligible for purchase incentives are sometimes still eligible for lease incentives. It's how Hyundai and some other automakers whose cars didn't qualify for federal tax credits were able to offer such impressive lease deals because the lease deals were able to factor that incentive in as a lump sum. The other point to make here is that, in general, dealerships make more money from lease deals than they do finance packages. You, as a buyer, can go and get your finance package elsewhere, and that means that the dealership loses out on any profit they can make from that. But even when you do originate a loan with your dealership, the kickback they receive is far smaller than it would be for a lease. In addition to making more from finance packages than purchase packages, auto dealerships also get to usually benefit from the whole lease return process, something that usually happens every few years. They get to charge fees for handling the lease return, and if there's any repair needed, they usually carry that out as well, skimming some profit from you and the automaker in the process. And of course, in some cases, those same automakers get to sell off lease returns as certified used vehicles. Those vehicles also tend to be fairly low mileage examples too, since your average run-of-the-mill lease agreement tax on incredibly high charges when you drive over your agreed mileage limit, normally no more than about 10,000 miles per year. That's not even mentioning the benefits that come to automakers and dealerships when you're back more frequently to get a new car than you might have been had you purchased one. So far, I've covered fairly common reasons auto dealerships and automakers want you to lease rather than buy, things that apply to both internal combustion and battery electric vehicles. And let's not forget either that for many customers, especially those with very predictable commutes and annual mileage totals within the lease limits, no children or pets and no hobbies that might get the car in a mess, this is a great deal, especially if they were on a tight budget. They pay less per month than they would purchasing. They often pay lower interest rates too and can sometimes get insurance rolled in as well.
People who are new to EVs also tend to pick leases, since if for some reason their new car isn't quite right, it's often a lot easier to get out of the lease without massive financial penalties. But let's look at the EV's specific reasons that automakers and auto dealers want you to lease. And these are, well, mostly about profit. Maybe they've got a copy of the rules of acquisition somewhere, hidden away behind a cupboard. You worthless, tiny-eared fool! Don't you know the first rule of acquisition? The first one is the fact that a lot of the value of an EV is tied up in its battery pack. While the battery pack should and usually does outlive the car it's in, that battery pack is still very much a massive asset. If the car is leased, the automaker ultimately has more control over what happens when the car is no longer usable. And although the majority of people leasing cars will lease for two or three years, return the car and lease another one, with their former car passing on to traditional used car ownership channels, it is becoming more and more common in markets around the world to see cars offered up for secondary leases. These vehicles, while no longer new, are given a full multi-point inspection, get any required repairs and upgrades, and are available to lease for less than a comparable new vehicle would be. After 10 years in the lease world, the car goes back to the dealership, who then hands it off to the automaker. The automaker then gets to recycle the car and its battery pack, with the battery pack either going into a second life battery project like a grid-tied energy storage project, which in of itself is extremely lucrative for the automakers, or the internal components of the battery packs are recycled to recover the expensive raw materials inside them. Those materials then go on to be used in either a new battery pack or some other manufacturing process. In both Tesla's and Ford's case, neither of which allow you to buy out your lease, and instead they take the car back. And those lightly used, lower mileage lease return vehicles are a great way for both companies to earn extra money. They can either sell those vehicles on as certified pre-owned for far more than your original run-of-the-mill used car dealership could, or they could put them out for another lease. Again, money is to be made. It's always about the money. And low rubs, but this is a SFW video. There are also potentials in the future where automakers could use lease deals to control just how older vehicles are removed from sale and therefore what parts catalogues for those vehicles look like. If an automaker doesn't allow customers to buy out their leases, then when a new shiny vehicle comes along, there's a higher possibility that existing customers who are leasing vehicles will be able to make the switch to a new model, while a private financed customer, they may keep that car for a lot longer, until at least they've paid off far more of the amount of finance they originally borrowed. I should also throw in here that the difficult matter of recalls and issues plays a part too. If a vehicle is leased and there's a massive recall campaign or a buyback, it's a whole lot easier for the automaker to take that vehicle back than if it was sold outright. Because the leasing company is usually attached to the automaker. In fact, most major automakers have either their own financing partner or their own financing arm they can much more easily reach out to a customer and go, hey, we've got a new lease deal and this thing's gone wrong and we'd like to put you in a brand new shiny shiny and write off the rest of your lease. And that's a lot easier for them than the conversation that goes somewhere along the line of, uh, hi, we don't want to buy this car back from you, but you said you want us to because it's a lemon and if you twist our arm, we might give you some money for it. Once you have their money, you never give it back. Exactly. If you're not convinced, just talk to someone who leased a Chevrolet Bolt EV during the battery recall and then compare it to someone who purchased a car or financed it. The return experiences were very, very different. And that's also, of course, caused by risk and a whole lot of equity things. And I'm not going to go into that right now. Finally, before I talk a little more about people's reasons for leasing, let's also not forget that new types of leases are coming to market, basically subscription services that are pretty close to those offered for mobile phones. They're becoming more and more popular. 
Volvo's offering them and many other automakers are either already offering them in some markets or considering rolling them out in the future. These mobility subscription plans roll everything in, including telematics, insurance and service, sometimes even charging, and they represent the ultimate money grab for automakers. In some cases, Automakers are even bypassing the dealerships and go directly to you, the customer, meaning more money for them and less money for the dealerships. While that might sound less hassle and more convenient though, remember, once you are in a subscription model, it can be a lot harder to get out of it because you don't have any equity in the vehicle that you're driving. And pricing can change a lot more frequently than it might do for say a traditional lease or a traditional loan deal. I've no experience with this setup, however, so if you have done something like this, I'd love to know more of your experiences in the comments below. Frankly, the closest I've ever been to it was when I purchased my Renault Twizy in the UK and I had to lease the battery because the batteries weren't available to buy. It was fine for me, but for whomever purchased the car after me had to not only buy the car used, but they also had to take on my monthly battery lease as well. There's frankly a reason why that type of ownership model didn't really take off in Europe. Although I should also point out, many drivers do lease for very good reasons, especially EV drivers. They don't want to deal with issues pertaining to battery degradation, something early Nissan Leaf owners had to deal with far sooner than they'd hoped. Other EV owners take advantage of leasing to allow them to keep up to date with the incredible rate of change in the EV industry. I mean, just look at an EV from just 10 years ago and compare it with a car being made by the same automaker today and you will see a massive leap in terms of range, charging speed, onboard features and also, surprisingly, affordability. And while leasing is more affordable if you're on a tight budget, it also allows you to remain more up to date with the new hotness. And I don't want to be ageist here, but in my experience, the younger you are, the more likely it is you're going to want to keep up with the latest trends. But just remember, most modern EVs today come with comprehensive and long warranties and lease return fees can be astronomical if you go over mileage or there's significant damage to your vehicle. Sure, the dealership and the automaker get more out of leases from the residual value of a lease return to the value of the battery pack components under the floor. But at the end of the day, like any purchase, you should do what makes sense to you. And of course, always consult with a financial advisor or similar professional before making a big purchase decision. Because buying a new car is a big deal. And no, I'm not talking about me. I'm just an idiot who talks to a camera. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, about $10.08 per year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Tantalus A. Bond, Michael Baker, Christopher Lawrence, David J. Stober, Noah Tutak, and Ian Hoffman. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have an old fashioned PO box you can reach us at, address also below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below. This month, we're celebrating electric for everyone with an amazing new t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. 
We've got some fantastic content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube and we'll see you very soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video. But we all think that this one is also well worth a look. See you soon and as always, keep evolving!